Hello there guys, this is Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space. And today I'm bringing to you a Feb Regency review of The Vicar of Wakefield by Oliver Goldsmith. This is the story of the Vicar of Wakefield and his family and how they kind of fall from their wealthy position to a position of poverty and how that changes them and also how it doesn't change them. Some of the themes here are oppression of the poor by the rich, prison as rehabilitation instead of punishment, and perseverance in the face of difficulty. So before we get into the plot of the book, I definitely want to talk about the style of the book because that's the first thing that I fell in love with. And because the style is so good, everything else follows. Like the characters are really good and the plot is very lively after a certain point. So I started the book very slowly because the plot isn't really, it's not a particularly rousing plot until like somewhere near the end. But because of the writing, I savored every single word from the very beginning. And that's what made me completely invested from page one. And because of that, I savored every word and I didn't like rush through it and I didn't just listen to it on an audiobook. I literally read the whole thing because I wanted to catch every word. And I also want to mention the narrator of this audiobook, who is Patrick Toll. He was so fabulous at inhabiting the character of the vicar. Like his narration was just flawless, stunning, so perfect. And the vicar himself, he's a very humble character and very likable, but he's also just, he has a very strong, lovely, sensible voice. And it's really adorable how he turns everything into a sermon, you know, for the spiritual betterment of his family. He has several opportunities to go off into a homily during the course of the story and like, it's well-deserved. He's good at it, you know? And that is one thing that doesn't change throughout the story. The vicar himself does not change, even though his family makes mistakes and they are humbled in so many ways. His character does not change. His strength, which is God, God is his strength, does not change. But the way he presents things maybe changes a little bit throughout the story. In the beginning, he seems like a very st stereotypical black and white type person and everything that he says is very black and white. But their situation becomes more complex once they become suddenly poor and the longer the story goes on and the more the plot progresses, you know, they're trying to like marry off their daughters sensibly to men who are going to be able to take care of them and raise their status a little bit and stuff like this. Some of their behavior becomes a bit more gray instead of black and white because they're faced with the difficulty of providing for yourself. And at this time in Regency history, it was really difficult to provide for yourself. And I think that this is actually a theme that is close to the author's heart too, because he was very poor at different times. It sounds like he, he kind of had to live off of his own means. And at times that was not very much. He did not have very much in the way of means. And he is actually sort of, I'm not saying he's writing himself into this story, but the young man of the family, the oldest son, basically the dad tells him, you're going to have to go off now that we don't have any money. You're going to have to go off and pretty much care for yourself and hopefully support your family, send some money back to us. And it was very difficult for the son. You know, you hear from him later in the story and he actually comes back and says, um, this becomes a theme in the story. He says, I found that riches in general were in every country another name for freedom, and that no man is so fond of liberty himself as not to be desirous of subjecting the will of some individuals in society to his own. So this is a big thing and that's going to come into play very, very much so as the plot progresses in this story. We see all of their decisions become more difficult, more morally gray as they become more monetarily imperiled? <laughs> That's not, I'm sure, the best phrase that I could come up with, but, you know, I'm trying not to do this in 10,000 takes. So what ends up happening is when they are off living in the country, living with uh, a landlord, they are trying to be a farming family now and support an entirely different type of parishioner. Suddenly their landlord, he ends up being very predatory towards women and fake marries a bunch of women into, you know, sleeping with him basically. And that he preys on the daughter, on the oldest daughter, I believe, of the vicar. And the vicar is obviously furious about this. And there's a very Bennett-like scene with the Lydia storyline in 
Pride and Prejudice, there's some very Bennett-like moments happening in the story. And I'm definitely not saying that Jane Austen is copying this. I think it probably was, you know, similar, similar things happened anytime a lady's honor was in question or sullied, you know, the reputation of a family can just really take a nosedive. But I thought that the vicar's response to all that was just so refreshing. Um, he actually... When the landlord comes around and is just like, I don't know why you're all so mad. Just let her be my mistress and everything can keep on going as it's been going. You can keep being my tenants and nothing has to change. We can all stay happy. And the vicar is just like, gives him a homily. Listen to this. This is great. The vicar really knows how to take advantage of a moment and share his heart. And I just love that. He tells him, go and possess what fortune has given thee: beauty, riches, health, and pleasure. Go and leave me to want, infamy, disease, and sorrow. Yet, humbled as I am, shall my heart still vindicate its dignity. And though thou hast my forgiveness, thou shalt ever have my contempt. <laughs> Isn't that just great? Yeah, you can really see the oppression of the rich over the poor in this book. It's just, it's a continual theme. Um, as soon as, of course, the vicar tells this to his landlord, his landlord decides to ruin him and send him to debtor's prison. And, you know, within a couple pl plot points, all the children are dying and the father is dying in debtor's prison and he gives another really magnificent homily about how the miserable on earth, what consolation they receive from religion is that their death pangs are going to be much less severe seeming to somebody who's already been miserable on earth and knows every face of terror. It's not going to be so scary to die and they'll be happy to leave earth because they were miserable on earth and then they'll go to heaven. And they'll have the contrast and have happiness for the first time in forever. And he just gives this magnificent sermon and really kind of shows his moral grit. And while he's in prison, he's actually also very useful. He gets a prison pro program up and running for prisoners to be able to provide for themselves a little bit monetarily. And he also takes this opportunity to talk to us about how, you know, prisons shouldn't be just trying to punish people. They should be, like, there's certain people that need punishment. Like, if you're disrespecting life, you know, your life won't probably be need, needed to be taken from you but uh so he's he's against capital punishment though for almost everything like especially like theft apparently apparently there was still capital punishment for theft at the time of this book being written because he was writing against that and saying no we need to reform prisoners and not just send them to prison where they will learn a thousand other ways to break the law and we need to be uh, more cognizant of what sends people to desert, debtor's prison. And um, it's really also just a very magnificent speech. And he's up on his soapbox a lot, you know, throughout the story, but especially in prison. That was clearly one of the themes that Oliver Goldsmith wanted to get across in this book. And then, of course, the ending plot is just very quick. Lots of plot points all in succession. You could just tell that the author is writing this with a certain amount of humor and irony. When you think of, like, like Christian fiction today, like the movies, for example, is mostly what I've seen. I haven't read a lot of Christian, Christian fiction, but when a Christian fiction movie comes out and everything looks very bleak, but you know everything's going to turn around and end up okay, like that's kind of the feeling that you get from the end of this story, but the rest of the writing is with so much humility and wit and humor that I can really just picture Oliver Goldsmith writing all this with like a, tw a twist to his mouth. You know, it's, it's very funny to see how it all comes around, how in almost every single case, you know, the wife of the vicar, she's trying to turn things around for their monetary benefit because she is convinced that they have to make things happen versus the vicar believing that they have to leave the happening to God and just do what they've been told to do by God. And the way that the author uses the wife in the end of the story was quite funny and I really did enjoy the ending. It was quite a romp. So of course, as soon as I finished this, I had to start listening to the Ian Mortimer time traveler through Regency England again because 
I remembered him talking about how difficult it was for the poor at this time in Regency Britain because the population was expanding exponentially. And basically, it was difficult for everybody to get enough food. And the average life expectancy was really low because of high infant mortality. And um, it's just, yeah, I have to learn more about the period now. And this, this is my favorite thing to read that has come out of Regency so far other than like Jane Austen which I really want to go back now and read reread Pride and Prejudice physically and yeah, because I want to catch every single word because there was just so much that was similar to that in this and I just I feel like now I'm even more interested in the history of the world because I'm curious what Ian Mortimer was writing about and to. So that's what a good book can do for you. It really makes you curious about the period, right? And then the other thing, this book is just so incredibly quotable. And I'm just going to read you a few quotes here because it's just so enjoyable. And it can kind of give you a sense of the tone of the book. Conscience is a coward, and those faults it has not strength enough to prevent, it seldom has justice enough to accuse. Basically, if your conscience isn't going to prevent you from doing something, it's probably not going to make you feel too guilty about doing that thing, you know? It's too much of a coward, <laughs> which is true. You really have to be able to build up your conscience and your habits in order so that they match, so that you're not having cognitive dissonance, so that you can act the way you want to on a regular basis. It really takes a lot of discipline to get everything working in order in that sense. It's not just conscience alone that's gonna make you act right. You obviously need God too, did I mention that? Cheerfulness was never yet produced by effort, which itself is painful. <laughs> when you're a really miserable, that's another thing I really appreciated about this book. It doesn't try to be like, yeah, you need to cheer up in every situation. No, some situations are miserable and you just endure it. And that's all you can do. And that's all you need to do. That's all maybe God's calling you to do. Sometimes life on earth is miserable. And sometimes you can find a bright lining, but like in the case in this book, there really wasn't much of a silver lining other than what he said, which was, Heaven's gonna be really great if you've experienced tons of misery here on earth. You'll just be able to compare the two and just be so glad for the hope of heaven. As 10 millions of circles can never make a square, so the united voice of myriads cannot lend the smallish foundation to falsehood. I love this. Basically, you know, if, if lots of people are saying that this is right, that doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't make it right. You can't make a circle into a square. Even if there's a thousand people calling it a square, it's, you know, still, it's still a circle. So that is it, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this review. Definitely let me know down below if you've read this book, if you enjoyed this book, and what you read for Feb Regency, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye!